Hambini fans and welcome to another episode of Hambini Reams. <laughs> this one, my Instacrap lit up like a Christmas tree when Specialized released this, which I can best describe as an abomination or an April Fool's joke that has gone wrong. We better just check this pen is working because I'm going to be drawing all over this today. Right, first of all, remember to check out the website. I've got headset bearings now and I'm going to rule the world in bottom brackets. How many yen, John Crapstagram and Patreon as well. I've got some stuff on there that is not available on YouTube. Right, disclaimer, I've lifted the pictures from all sorts of places. They're mainly from Specialized website, used under fair use. Um, if you want the credit, just whack us an email. I'll put it in the box below. Right, this is the Specialized series, and it is what I could best describe as a structural engineering nightmare. Um, it's got the chunky tires and disc brakes, massive, is it 2X drivetrain? Maybe 1X, that one. Uh, but the elephant in the room is the compliance junction i think that's what they've called it the um, marketing bods from morgan hill california who have their bikes made in china for um you know a pittance uh, anyway it's a flat barred bike i mean i just don't know what else to say about it really it's all about this bit isn't it now if you were to plot that i'm not even going to talk about the rest of it um if you're going to plot that like in a truss diagram, some people call these FBDs, free body diagram. On the right here, I've basically done a normal bike. So double triangle, uh, your seat would be here, um, handlebars through here, wheel here, wheel here. Um, and there's four nodes there. So you've got the back wheel node, the bottom bracket, where the seat tube, top tube, and the stays touch meet is another node and the final node is basically the, the head tube now this is a schematic so um you know take from that what you will on the specialized this has got six nodes so uh the usual node there the bottom bracket this intermediate node the headset or head tube um the junction between the seat tube top tube and um uh, well, it's not even the stays, is it? <laughs> it's just two there. And uh, then this one here as well. Now, the fundamental thing with having this sort of frame, so uh, let me just erase all the ink. The fundamental reason for doing this is because you eliminate or strictly reduce bending moments. So each of these nodes, there's really only pure tension and co and compression that are acting on them. There's no real twisting moment, yeah. So uh, you've got a member going that way, so that's going tensile and compressive forces. Same there, same there, um, same there, and there. On this, what you've, you've got is you've eliminated a triangle because one of the rules of the triangle is if you make the sides a fixed length you cannot alter its shape whereas if you make it a cube or not cube a rectangle or a square you can actually and they were a pin joint you can make them into like a diamond shape and that's what's happened here in order to make these kind of shapes strong you tend to have to put reinforcing things around the corners um, gussets for example on this frame this has got multiple degrees of freedom around here The forces that are acting on here, are you've got compression, tension, but you've also got bending moments um, or torques, if you want to call it like that, to stop the thing breaking. So if, if, if for example, I pick the um, bottom bracket here, what we've got to do is you've got to stop this member here from twisting that way. You've also got to stop this member here from twisting that way. So that joint has to be reinforced. Um, now, if I just go back to one slide, so raise all the link, link on here. 
they've actually tuned it. Well, it looks like they've tuned this by making this member much thinner than this one and this one. So when this ends up moving, it's more likely to, well, that's going to go down and bend on here. That angle is probably critical because if you draw that like that and you're applying a force downwards, you're basically putting the top of that one into compression and the top of that one into compression from the load. So that that's, um, I think that's, you know, intentional. If they moved it and let's say brought the, um, tube a bit further down so let's say the tube was down here and they had it like that you've now got a load of forces that are um, acting basically in the wrong direction for you so they had to do that so that that you know is a necessity and they've made that a bit smaller right this don't accuse me of uh, not trying very hard because i didn't this is actually PowerPoint. I'm going to demonstrate what I mean. So I've just clicked on these to keep them locked, basically. You've got a degree of freedom that's like that. So when this is exaggerated, but this is how this thing's going to move up and down. Um, the, I mean, the, this is really verging on, I think, almost ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Um, the complications involved in adding material in there are just unbelievable. There is one mode that all the shill channels haven't really uh, investigated, which is the twisting mode. So this is SolidWorks. I don't have the weldments on my system. Um, so yeah, excuse the uh, phallic symbols on there, but this is just a, I really did use a fag packet uh, sketch. So this is a sketch of the frame. So you've got the, the back dropouts here and the bottom bracket junction here. But this is really to illustrate more than anything. So this is how this works. You've got a great big void here with nothing in it. Now, if you look at the frame from this perspective, if I was to twist the frame, oops, if I was to twist the frame um, sort of anti-clockwise, you've got nothing really to support that. That load's coming through the um, the seat stays so that there's quite a big torsional load on there. And in that direction, the fr most bike frames aren't actually that stiff. They're all stiff like here, but when you get it into twist, they're not that stiff. And that's one of the reasons many professional cyclists always tend to pick the smaller frames, because if you make the members smaller, and in the, the torsional direction, they tend to be much stiffer. Just to give you a bit of background on what compliance is, compliance is really the difference between vibration that's going in and the vibration that's coming out or being felt. So if we put in a little graph, and let's say the vibration looks like that, and what you feel is actually that, you'd probably say that's a fairly compliant structure. The problem, and it is a very pertinent problem on a bike, is the maths behind it. Now, in purely engineering terms, everything is described in NVH or no noise, vibration and harshness as a mass spring damper system. So mass kind of speaks for itself, depends how big and fat you are. K, which is the spring, uh, which again kind of speaks for itself and then C, which is the damping coefficient. Now, um, the damping coefficient is sometimes a bit more difficult to explain, but it really means that the force against something moving. So if you put your hand in the water, you have no damping coefficient because your hand's not moving. The faster you move your hand, the more resistance you get. When you come to a stop, you've again got no viscous movement. There are a couple of ways that can happen. So every material does have an element of damping, um, but you know, Coulomb dampers, which is like a friction damper is one method, or a viscous damper, which a lot of cars have, like shock absorbers, is another method. The issue is you've got uh, a damper that will have to be tuned for a huge range of masses. So if we said it was 105 kilos, 
versus 75 kilos. Now, if you're in a car, that mass spring damper, your weight is almost insignificant. It becomes significant sometimes when you fill it full of cement when you need to go and do your home repairs. But at the, the, the small level, it doesn't really make a difference. You know, if, if someone gets in the car versus um, someone who's like 20 kilos difference, it's not really going to make that much difference. On a bike, it makes a huge difference because the weight of the individual is far more than the weight of the bike. And they've got, uh, as a system weight, it's a huge difference. It's like you know, 20%. If you did 20% on the weight of a car, you'd know about it. Um, so one ton car, you go and add um, 200 kilos to it, you'd no notice that. Um, the, the thing with the, the way the specialized system works is they are really concentrating on the K term they're not really thinking about the C term. And then arguably the C term, which is the damping, uh, tends to have more effect on the compliance. Now there are a few other ways and means of doing it. So on the right, we've got the Trek ISO speed, and that's more like a, I guess, like a Coulomb damper. And then this one, which um, fell out of fashion, really, I think Pinarello dropped it fairly quickly, but that's got your typical uh, almost looks like an MTB damper, um, viscous damper in there, and that is, you know, changing your C term. Um, now, the thing with this is the C and the K term, so the damping and the spring coefficient, or uh, um, tension coefficient, are not mutually exclusive. So if you go and um, tweak one, you will have an effect on the other. Now, as a purist, this is possibly what you could also achieve with uh, with with what Specialized have tried to get. So there's um, the spring, which is quite visible there, versus all of that tomfoolery, or tomfuckery, as some people might say, in putting a leaf spring halfway off the bike. Now, some thoughts. As I mentioned earlier, you cannot adjust that spring so it's you know geometry effects um the tuning of the thickness of the carbon is is what is going to have an effect on on the final outcome um in torsion and it it doesn't really describe it in any of the shield channels it is going to flex because you can add m way more material but you really have to bulk it up to to stop the twist uh, just purely by geometry and then the increase in flexibility is always a loss of power because you get some wind up torque. So as you put your foot down, you bend the frame slightly. Once the frame has got to a happy medium, then your power is applied. As you lift off, the frame will de-stress, deflex, um, and then go back to its natural position. Each of those little repetitive cycles will lose some power. So it's a bit like if you've ridden an, M uh, ridden an MTB bike where you haven't locked the shocks up, um, you, you'll tend to bounce. Um, it's a bit different on an MTB bike because they tend to have viscous dampers. So you, you know, you, the loss is heat into that liquid. Um, I mean, I looked at this and it is literally, you know, you, you would never design it like that unless you had an underlying reason to want that much flexibility the amount of material they have to add is it, it must be ridiculous i bet the frame must weigh bucket loads um yeah i don't know i mean it just looks like they've made a bike purely to sell but it's not technically that good. And these kind of bikes, this one, the Mado and all that, I can see the next iteration, they're just binning it and saying, yeah, we've improved the aerodynamics by like 20% or whatever. Yeah, don't know what to say about that. Right, that is the end of this video. If you did enjoy it, remember to smash that like button. If you didn't, go screw yourself. And as always, keep banging your hairdresser.